Good afternoon and welcome to the National Museum of the Pacific Wars webinar series. My name is Reagan Grau. I'm the Director of Collections and Exhibits here at the museum. Today we've got J. Michael Winger with us, joining us from North Carolina. Um, he studied history at Barton College and Duke University, taught history at the Wake County Public Schools, and is currently working on a six volume series for the Naval Institute Press with two other co-authors, focusing on the Japanese attack of Oahu in 1941. And Mike's been a, an active researcher since the 1970s and we're pleased to have him present for you all today. Mike, welcome aboard. We're looking forward to it. I really, I really appreciate this invitation. All right, is everybody seeing that? Yes. Again, once again, Reagan, thank you very, very much uh, for that kind uh, introduction. It's a pleasure for me to uh, present today to the uh, National Museum of the Pacific War. Uh, this presentation regarding the attacks on the Naval Air Station in Pearl Harbor is an extension of a program that I gave for the National Park Service uh, at the Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Hawaii uh, some years back. There you go. By 1941, the Naval Air Station on Ford Island boasted a long and venerable history. Other islands, other airfields on the island, on Oahu, NES Kaneohe Bay, and the Eva Mooring Mast Field were less than a year old in 1941, with NES Barbara's Point still in the land clearing stages. But NES Pearl Harbor had been in place for a generation, serving as the focal point for Navy aviation on the island of Oahu. <clears throat> Situated in the center of Pearl Harbor, Port Island was the epicenter of the Japanese bombing attacks on American naval forces in Hawaii. In fact, it was at the very foot of Fort Island that the first bombs fell into the harbor leaving their ghosts in the pavement there to this day. The sailors, Marines, and their families on Fort Island were thoroughly enmeshed in the events of the attack, the memory of which would haunt many until the end of their days. Situated in the center of Pearl Harbor, Fort Island was known to native Hawaiians as Moku Ume Ume, or the Isle of Attraction. In 1865, Caroline Jackson purchased the island and later married Dr. Seth Porter Ford, a physician and native of Connecticut. Shortly before the doctor's death, the couple renamed the landmass Ford Island. In 1891, their heirs sold the island to the Honolulu Plantation Company. Shortly before World War I, the United States negotiated the transfer of Fort Island to the government and thence to the U.S. Army, which developed a landing field there late in the war. The first military tenant of the island was the 6th Aero Squadron, which took station in September of 1917. On 29 April 1919, the Army renamed the facility Luke Field after the famed American balloon busting fighter ace of the Great War. The Army continued expansion of the facility after the war. Although the Army and the Navy were to occupy Port Island with two separate facilities, the Navy's first aviation presence, the Pacific Air Attachment, was first located in the vicinity of what is now the repair basin in the Pearl Harbor Navy Yard in late 1919. By the early 1920s, construction of the Navy's first buildings at the foot of Fort Island was complete with a seaplane hangar, offices, storehouses, and shops. On 17 January 1923, the men of the Pacific Air Attachment moved from the Navy Yard to their new home on Fort Island. With the addition of a second seaplane hangar in the late 1920s, 
That presaged the building boom of the 1930s, during which the Navy added by mid-decade two more seaplane hangars, a final assembly shop, an overhaul facility, and a new enlisted barracks. <clears throat> by 1939, however, Army aviation on the north side of the island moved to the recently completed Hickam Field. The Army's departure set the stage for a building boom and building uh, demolition and the construction of two large land plane hangars for the fleet's carrier air groups. Now occupying all of Fort Island, the station was also home to the squadrons of Patrol Wing 2 and the utility squadrons of the Pearl Harbor Base Force. Early on 7 December 1941, there was little to suggest that the men could anticipate anything but a routine Sunday morning. Although eight of the Pacific Fleet's battleships were in port, many of the patrol wing's PBY patrol bombers were absent. VP-21 was on advanced deployment at Midway, screening the return of Task Force 8, centered on the carrier Enterprise, having re reinforced the garrison at Wake Island with Marine fighters from VMF 211. <clears throat> VP 22 had just returned to Pearl Harbor on 5 December after a deployment to Midway and Wake. Four aircraft, meanwhile, from VP 24 were engaged in intertype training with a submarine gudgeon in operating area C5 off the island of Maui. The station's remaining patrol bombers lay on the aprons, ramps, and in the hangars undergoing maintenance. On Fort Island, some of the men and the families anticipated a peaceful Sunday of rest. At Quarters K, Rear Admiral Patrick Bellinger, commander of Pat Wing 2, was in bed recuperating from a bad case of influenza. In Quarters B, among the four family flats on the southeast shore of Fort Island, Chief Shipfitter Albert Moulter was at home swabbing the deck while his wife Esther, who was four months pregnant, made waffle batter for breakfast. In the enlisted barracks, California native and storekeeper Jacob Rogofsky donned the uniform of the day, undress whites, and reported to the first floor mess anticipating a sumptuous breakfast. Chief Radioman's mate, Thomas Farrow, drew duty that Sunday as well. Leaving his house in Aiea, he returned to Fort Island Saturday evening, but was up early at 0500 for breakfast due to report to Fort Island's control tower at 0800. In the administration building on Fort Island, Lieutenant Frank Erickson, an aviator from the Coast Guard cutter Tani, awaited the arrival of his 0800 relief with thoughts turning to the day that he had planned with his family in Waikiki. <clears throat> As Privates Dudovic, Young, and Zeller of the Marine Color Guard marched up and posted for colors at 0753, Erickson stepped back into his office and ensured that the assistant officer of the day stood ready to play the recording of colors over the loudspeaker system. Thus, whether for recuperation, pursuit of pleasure, or fulfillment of duty, from rear admiral to the lowest boot camp arrival, the men of Fort Island stood ready to meet the day, and the serene dawn breaking to the east indicated a typical morning was in the offing. Meanwhile, in the administration building, Wing Communications Officer Lieutenant Dick Ballinger received a puzzling message from 14P1, a PBY patrolling south of the island. The message stated, sank enemy submarine one mile off Pearl Harbor entrance. Immediately, Ballinger picked up the telephone, dialed 663, and rang quarters M at the north end of Fort Island. 
The ringing telephone awakened wing operations officer, Commander Logan Ramsey. Ramsey then called Sink Pack headquarters, where the duty officer, Commander Vincent Murphy, informed him of a similar curious message from the destroyer ward. Dressing hurriedly in slacks and an Aloha shirt, Ramsey drove his 1939 Oldsmobile to the administration building and commenced work on a research on a search plan in the wing plotting room. Outside the building, the Marine color guard stood by ready for morning colors. While Ramsey worked on his plan, noise to the north of an aircraft diving on the station attracted his attention outside. The aircraft outside, however, were not American, but Japanese, specifically nine Aichi type 99 carrier bombers under the command of Lieutenant Commander Takahashi Kakuichi and part of an inbound strike of 183 aircraft. Takahashi's unit of 26 dive bombers separated from the main formation over the coast northwest of Wheeler Field and bore down the island's central plain. From a position northeast of Pearl Harbor, Takahashi dispatched two of his three divisions to attack Hickam Field, while the remaining nine aircraft under his personal command entered a right-hand spiral out of which the dive bombers went into their single file attack formation. Takahashi penetrated the clouds northeast of the harbor and screamed down toward the hangars at the foot of Fort Island. Back in the administration building, Ballinger and Ramsey attempted to determine the identity of the offending American aviator. Crossing the corridor near the stairway leading down to the radio room, they strode to the adjacent windows where they saw an aircraft zooming away from the station. Ramsey yelled to Ballinger, Dick, did you get his number? Ballinger replied, no, but I think it was a squadron commander's aircraft because I saw a band of red on it. At that instant, an explosion and red flash in the distance led Ramsey to think that the reckless pilot had crashed. But the explosion of a second bomb and the appearance of more aircraft then left no doubt in Ramsey's mind as to the reality at hand. Never mind, he shouted at Ballinger, it's a Jap. Ramsey jumped across the, back across the hall to wing plot and dial 661 to raise Rear Admiral Bellinger in quarters K. In a very brief conversation, Ramsey told the Admiral that the planes were actually bombing the hangars. The news floored Bellinger, who responded with the incredulous retort, you wouldn't kid about a thing like that. Ramsey threw down the telephone, running across the hall to the communications room. And after raising radio room supervisor, David Montgomery on the voice tube, Ramsey instructed him to broadcast on all wavelengths and over all means of communication and in plain English, air raid Pearl Harbor, stop. This is no drill. Ramsey scurried back to wing plot to complete his search plan. The time was 0758. Even as thunderous explosions rocked Fort Island, on board the cruiser St. Louis in the Pearl Harbor Navy Yard, gunner Wilfred Wallace watched events unravel to the Southwest and experienced the curious phenomenon of acoustical shadows experienced so frequently during artillery bombardments of the American Civil War. Off in the distance, the planes dropped their deadly payloads which caused flame, but no sound. Leading his command section, Lieutenant Commander Takahashi's bomb fell at water's edge on ramp four, sending up an immense column of water, mud, and concrete shards hurtling skyward. The explosion disabled the ramp with a huge slab of concrete and fouled access to the parking apron. Takahashi's two wingmen, 
targeted VP-22's aircraft with two explosions on a line extending northeast from the water's edge. The pilots landed solid hits among the PBYs on the sloping pavement south of Hangar 6. Next in line and leading the sixth aircraft of the third Chutai, Lieutenant Hira Kunikio shifted northeast and targeted Hangar 6. He overshot the building with his bomb landing midway between the hangar and the shore. His two wingmen dropped close aboard the east face of the hangar with one bomb striking the small arms magazine on the northeast corner of the hangar. Fires broke out in the hangar, setting fire to offices in the lean-to on the building's east face. Meanwhile, with a towering column of smoke obscuring the target area, the trailing section under Warrant Officer Kokobu Toyomi entered the fray in echelon left, conforming to the pre-established stepladder tactics, Kokobu's bomb burst among the aircraft near the west corner of Hangar 38 with the nearby patrol and scout planes going up in flames. Kokobu's two wingmen targeted the buildings northeast of the aircraft. The first bomb penetrated the roof of Hangar 38 but failed to detonate, embedding itself into the floor although the concussion carried away some of the structure's fascia and side window lights. The last pilot released still farther north, his bomb exploding in the street beyond. All told, however, Takahashi's attack had disabled much of the fleet's capability to search for the Japanese invaders. The sole fatality from the station's company or attached squadrons fell to Japanese gunfire during these bombing attacks. Machine gun fire struck aviation ordnanceman Theodore W. Croft as he emerged from Hangar 6 to fight fires among the PBYs. Croft, who was a native of Berlin, Georgia, left behind his wife Ruth and two young stepsons, Gerard and Donald. Ironically, the young, youngsters were fishing at Pearl City across from Fort Island where their father lay dead. Amidst the chaos, the color guard did not wait for colors to sound. Unflinchingly, Privates Dudovic, Young, and Zeller hoisted the stars and stripes with the same smartness and precision that characterized their participation in peacetime ceremonies. Takahashi's dive bombers also strafed the utility plane parking areas to the west and south, disabling most of the aircraft of VJ-2 at Hangar 170, 177. Fortunately, only two Japanese crossed the island to attack VJ-1's parking area adjacent to Hangar 37, as evidenced in their ship's action report. At about that juncture, the Naval Air Station lost electrical power, disabling its radio transmitters. Chief Radioman's mate, Frank D'Augustine of VJ-1, ran out to a JRS-1 utility plane near Hangar 37, powered up the radio, and opened communications with NAS Maui, and later with aircraft searching for the Japanese carriers. Meanwhile, as casualties from the ships on Battleship Row poured into the station's dispensary, the doctors there prepared for the rush of casualties using every available space to care for the wounded sailors. Arriving on Fort Island at about 0805, Lieutenant Cecil Riggs directed Lieutenant J.G. Kenneth Longway to care for men in the first floor ward. Lieutenant Arnold uh, Walter Arnold tended to wounded sailors in the outpatient department, while Lieutenant Elmer Schusler of the Dental Corps established a first aid station in the mess hall in a nearby enlisted barracks. Meanwhile, with fires at the station burning out of control, 18 SBD dot scout bombers from the carrier Enterprise closed on Oahu during the attack with some attempting to land on Fort Island. Commander Howard Young with Lieutenant Commander Brumfield Nickel as a passenger 
attempted to raise the tower, but to no avail. Then lowering his landing gear, Young sat down on the station's runway, rolling to a stop near the still burning Hangar 6 at 0825. Greeted by the station's commander, Captain James Shoemaker, both Young and Nickel demanded angrily, what the hell goes on here? Captain Shoemaker might have told Young that his patrol squadrons were trying to get airborne at that very moment. The first such aircraft, 23P4, its engines barely visible here, had just rolled out of Hangar 54, crewed by Lieutenant Commander Massey Hughes, second pilot, Lieutenant Jimmy Ogden, and enlisted third pilot, Theodore Thewson, manning the bow gun. Hughes took off and shaped a westerly course in the direction of French frigate shoals. Preparations for additional searches move forward, although interrupted by the arrival of yet another attack wave. NAS Pearl Harbor again came under direct attack, this time by high-level bombers from the carrier Shokaku under the command of Lieutenant Irikin Yoshiaki. During Irikin's first bomb run from the southwest, clouds and smoke obscured the hangars at the foot of Fort Island. Aborting, Irikin circled and reset, intending to bomb the land plane hangars along the northwest shore of Fort Island. During the second run, a premature release occurred over Waipio Peninsula. Holding some of their bombs back, Irikin's crews dropped again, targeting berth F-10 and the seaplane tender Tangier, which suffered only minor damage from numerous near misses. Only one of the bombs even came close to the original target area, falling among the technical buildings along the northwest shore with a blast disabling the station's artesian well. In building 171 at that time, only aviation ordnanceman Frank Morey suffered injuries. The only other strike on Fort Island during the second wave was a 250 kilogram bomb from a dive bomber attacking the battleship California. Only one of three bombs struck the battleship. One of the other two pilots, perhaps distracted by anti-aircraft fire, released too high. The bomb arched over the ship following into the dispensary's tiled central courtyard, while a great many wounded lay in the open on three rows of mattresses. Fortunately, the patio deflected the force of the blast upward, opening in a crater seven feet deep and 20 feet wide. By a miracle, none of the patients, doctors, or corpsmen suffered injuries, although the dispensary lost its electrical and water connections. As few additional PBYs were available to search for the Japanese during the next critical hours, Commander John Murphy, who commanded the base force's utility wing, offered the services of his planes and crews from VJ-1. Although the squadron's unarmed Sikorsky JRS-1s and the short-winded Grumman J-2F ducks were ill-suited for the search missions, VJ-1 assembled five crews for the Sikorskys and three crews for the Ducks. There were plenty of volunteer gunners for the JRS-1s, almost all sailors and all armed with bolt-action rifles. It is uncertain which JRS crew took off first, but it is possible that Ensign Wesley Ruth and second pilot Chief Aviation Machinist Mate Emery Geis crewed the first aircraft. 1J1. The lumbering amphibian took off northeast, intending to search a sector directly north of Oahu. 20 miles out, however, at approximately 1310, Ruth's lumbering aircraft drew the attention of the Japanese combat air patrol from the carrier Zuikaku. Two carrier fighters charged in from astern, piloted by petty officers Ito Jinjiro and Iwamoto Tetsuo. Ensign Ruth maneuvered up into a cloud bank, <clears throat> lost his pursuers, and set a return course for Fort Island. His aircraft, seen here on 8 December, 
was the only American aircraft to make direct contact with a Japanese carrier force. <clears throat> At about the same time as Ruth, Ensign Niles Larson took off with Carpenter William Byrd as second pilot in 1J7 and shaped a westerly course south of the island of Niihau. Following a negative search, the crew returned late in the afternoon as evidenced by the aircraft's presence in this 8 December photograph. Lieutenant J.G. James Robb, with machinist Donald Wright as second pilot in 1J4, took off from Fort Island flying northwest on a course that bisected Kauai. Robb flew around that island and also Niihau on the return leg, but had nothing to report when the crew landed safely later that afternoon. The flight of Lieutenant J.G. Gordon Bolser was more eventful. Taking off with second pilot aviation machinist mate William A. Simpson in 1J6, the crew included two Marines, one of whom was Sergeant Thomas Haley from the battleship Oklahoma's Marine Detachment. As the aircraft approached the island of Niihau on the outbound leg of the search, a lone Japanese fighter approached from the direction of Niihau and attempted a firing pass from astern. Like Ensign Ruth, Bolson pulled up on the control column and into the overcast, eluding the pursuing zero. The attacker, probably Petty Officer First Class Nishikaichi Shigenori, was en route to a rendezvous off Niihau where he was to ditch and be picked up by a submarine although he later crash landed on the island of Niihau. Lieutenant Bolzer returned safely with 1J6 undergoing engine maintenance in Hangar 37 during 8 December, as seen in this photo. The last of the JRS-1 crews to take off was that of Ensign John Edwards, with aviation machinist mate William Evans on board as second pilot in 1 J-10. During the search, Edwards' crew sighted nothing except the empty Pacific and returned with nothing to report. Seen here on 8 December, ground crews set to work painting out the plane's side numbers and garish pre-war colors in non-secular blue, sea blue paint. Meanwhile, three two-man crews assembled for the J-2F ducks, then warming up on the apron outside Hangar 37. The crews included three enlisted pilots, aviation machinist mates Robert Fauber, David Lesher, and Lee Schweitzer. Schweitzer drew 1J-22, with search plans calling for all three aircraft to fly short crossover pat patrols and patterns to the west-southwest. Before climbing on board with his rear gunner, Schweitzer's thoughts turned to his wife, Doris. Realizing that he might never see her again, quickly he wrote a short letter of farewell in case he failed to return. In this brief note, which his family found and only opened five years ago, he poured out his heart to his young wife of less than a year. My dearest Doris, the horrible thing has happened. Only have a very few minutes and I'll take to the air once more, perhaps for my last time. Just remember, darling, I was a true blue husband and I'm sorry that you have to be left out here in this hellhole. Always be your true self and don't let this harden you. You're too sweet for that. Must hurry, your husband, Lee. Fortunately, the three ducks, including Robert Fauber's 1J20, seen here, encountered nothing but empty seas, and all three enlisted pilots returned safely. In the darkness, as night settled upon Fort Island, there was bedlam in the Navy Yard across the channel. There was the clatter of crews at work at the station, clearing wreckage, and making repairs in the murk. In nervous, muted conversations, 
sailors passed rumors, mostly regarding the threats of Japanese invasion. Sporadic firing of various intensity broke out during the evening hours, climaxing in a horror-filled arrival of six fighters from the carrier Enterprise. Three of the pilots, Lieutenant J.G. Fritz Hevel, Ensign Eric Allen, and Ensign Herbert Mangus were killed when gunners in the harbor and elsewhere opened fire as the six Wildcats passed down the main channel with running lights on. 7 December 1941 was a day that none of the individuals on Fort Island would forget. The memories etched into their souls as words graven into stone. In the succeeding months, years, and generations, these survivors needed no prompting to remember Pearl Harbor, as the experiences of that day had become part of their lives forever. Rather, it is for us, their posterity, to honor and remember these men by remembering Pearl Harbor. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. Um, if you're all set, we can jump right into the questions. If you're, sure. if you're all, if you're ready. Our, our first question is from Andrew and he's asking what types of bombs were used by the Japanese? Um, okay, well, there were different bombs used in different locations. And most of the uh, airfields, they were primarily using 250 kilogram land bombs fused to explode after about, uh, I think, uh, eight hundredths of a second or something like that to allow the bombs to penetrate and create deep craters. Uh, the one exception to that was, uh, uh, was uh, the second wave attacks on NAS Pearl Harbor and Hickam, where they use 60 kilogram bombs as, as well. Um, uh, now, they, if you're talking about the ships, that was something entirely different. Uh, against the, uh, the battleships in the harbor, they were using uh, specially modified 16 inch artillery, naval artillery shells that had the tail shaved down and uh, tail fuses installed to, uh, to try to penetrate the armor of the battleships. And in fact, it was one of those weapons that blew up the Arizona. Mike, I've got another question here from, uh, from Ron. He wants to know why Yamamoto did not attack the oil tank farms or the repair facilities out there on Oahu. That, that's, that's an excellent question. And it goes to the uh, Japanese strategy and what they were really after by attacking Pearl Harbor. The main object of the enlarged war with the United States, Great Britain, and the Dutch was to seize the uh, natural resources of the Netherlands East Indies and, and elsewhere. There were other places as well. But in the Netherlands East Indies were the uh, oil, rubber, and tin that you needed. All of the uh, well, not all of the raw materials, but many of the raw materials that you needed for, for war production. So they had to seize that, but they knew that if they tried that, the Americans would probably get into the war and they would be involved in uh, combating a fleet which had not been damaged and for which there'd be no hope to emerge victorious. So Yamamoto figured that it would be best to take out or not take out necessarily, but to neutralize the Pacific fleet for about six months uh, so that the uh, uh, Navy and the Army could go on their rampage in, in the South Pacific and Southwest Pacific, seize these assets, then hunker down behind this uh, series, a series of islands and atoll, atolls where they were going to erect a defensive barrier that Americans would just get sick of beating their head against. Well, that strategy made it unnecessary to attack the, uh, the, the fuel supplies and the, uh, the repair facilities in the Pearl Harbor Navy Yards. Is that, at least that is what the Japanese thought. They said, we just wanna buy six months, neutralize the uh, American, uh, uh, neutralize the, the American fleet and then sit back and wait for them where the Yamato spirit would help us defeat the American fleet in home waters. 
Okay, I've got another question from Scott here, who's uh, he wants to know that uh, from other sources that he has read, they have uh, discussed how a third wave was detailed to attack the oil tanks. And if, uh, if, if so, do you think that was Yamamoto's decision or was it a Nagumo decision? Well, and why did uh, this, is a, this is another uh, important question. And in this, this fifth volume, we're going to deal with the debate which was going on supposedly on Akagi's bridge about whether they were gonna go back again. Uh, in nothing I have ever seen was any hard planning done for a third wave. Nagumo was not a carrier admiral, he was a destroyer admiral, and he was a nervous wreck until they got away from Hawaii. He, you know, got, having gotten away with uh, giving the uh, Pacific fleet a bloody nose, he was not going to, to tempt fate by trying to go back again. And uh, in fact, he, he made that point before the attack. So there, were, there had been some thought about it, probably by some of the aviators and certainly by Fuchida and Genda, but no hard plans made. And there was another reason why they just did not want to do that. They were scared silly about uh, encountering American submarines, and, which we had by the boatload out there. And uh, they didn't want to be uh, caught by submarines and be attacked. They also had lost track of all the American carriers. So why tempt fate by hanging around? And so they went back. There was also a problem with fuel. How were they going to recall the, the tankers that they had sent north uh, out of harm's way to, to refuel the uh, destroyers and to a lesser extent, the cruisers and other carriers? I've got another question on deck here from Ronald. He wants to know how much and what kind of resistance was put up by the Americans? Did they get credit for shooting down any planes other than our own? <laughs> uh, there was a tremendous resistance. Uh, one of the um, misconceptions, I think, is that the Americans were really not asleep. I mean, we, we had uh, all kinds of activity ongoing during the night and the early morning hours of 7 December. It was more or less business as usual. And frankly, I thought I'd forgotten where we were going with this. What was the question again? <laughs> I'm sorry. About the resistance and, and whether or not okay. uh, we're, Americans were credited for shooting down any planes other than our own. Yes. Well, once the, once the attack got started, I mean, uh, we, we, it was the uh, uh, policy of the Navy during that time to leave a certain number of, of anti-aircraft emplacements manned and have ready ammunition brought out and have and have people stationed there so they could begin firing immediately if, if something untoward happened. Of course, we weren't expecting that, but at least we were prepared for that. And almost immediately, the Americans began firing back. And in fact, if you look at the Japanese air group records, and if you'll get uh, this uh, Ronald's email, I'll uh, be happy to, um, uh, to, to, to share some of these documents with him. Uh, it shows that there were a number of aircraft in the very front of the torpedo attacks that were coming in very early. They were taking enemy fire. And uh, by the time that the torpedo attack really got underway, they were firing three inch shells out of, the, uh, out of some of the ships that were uh, moored in the submarine base. So we were very active with anti-aircraft fire and that was pretty inaccurate. And the guys were firing practice ammunition instead of live service ammunition. That, that, that's another story. Um, we did uh, shoot down five of the torpedo bombers coming in, uh, partly because they came in over the Southeast lock from, um, I'm trying to figure out which way is east according to the the monitor here, but uh, but anyway, they were they were coming in from uh, east to west down the southeast lock, which was like a bowling alley, going toward the battleships. Well, the problem with that was once the Americans were alerted, there were any number of vessels that were moored in that area that were just waiting for these planes to come in, just like ducks in the shooting gallery. And they shot down five of the last seven aircraft. All right. so we've been fully alerted. I mean, it would have been a bloodbath for, Jap for the Japanese. We might have gotten a pretty a big bloody nose ourselves, 
but we'd have shot down many, many uh, more aircraft, during, particularly during the torpedo attacks. I got another one here from Lou, wants to know, is it possible that one reason the Japanese were unwilling to continue the attacks was because no American carriers were at Pearl Harbor that day? And perhaps a counterattack could potentially erase initial gains with possible losses. I, I, I agree with that totally. You know, the Japanese were just paranoid. Where, in the name of heaven, were these carriers? Where were they? You know, there are all the searches they did, and they actually sent some, uh, some float planes out from the battleships and cruisers out to the outlying, area, outlying areas uh, to either side of the, the, the carrier task force. And they couldn't find anything. And they said, where are these ships? And they said, if we get caught with our pants down, we're, 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 we stand a chance of losing a lot of the, of, of, our, uh, the, of the ships in our own force, including the carriers. And they were depending very, very heavily on these aircraft carriers to support the invasions of the South where all these natural resources were, were, uh, were situated. And that was another one of the reasons Nagumo wanted to get the heck out. He, he knew that he, he would, uh, he had been charged, if possible, get these carriers back intact. And that's what he did. I've got another question from, from uh, Chris. He would like to know if it was true that, Fu that Fuchida was the first to launch and the last to land. No, he was not the first to take off. Uh, the, the first aircraft to take off were the Zero fighters from the combat air patrols that were launched just in front of the air groups that took off for Pearl Harbor. There, there I think there were six aircraft each from the Shokaku and Zuikaku and three aircraft, three fighters from the Soryu. Uh, in, in concert with that, all the fighters of the first wave began to launch from, from the, the carriers, the Akagi, Kaga, and the Hiryu, and then following on from the other carriers. And only then were the bombers behind uh, launched. Now, uh, Fuchida was at the front of the bombers. He was the, probably one of the, among the first bombers to, uh, to launch from the carriers. Um, uh, theory, I, I've heard, I've heard him say that he was the last to land. That kind of makes sense. Uh, he did stay behind over Oahu taking pictures and kind of doing some reconnaissance. And uh, he, uh, he uh, flew back and said he was uh, the last to land. Uh, he, he does give a time for that, I think, in, in one of his uh, interviews with Gordon Prang. And that reminds me, I probably need to check that against the landing times that are specified in all six, of, in, in all, there are about 20 air group reports from, from the harbor, from, from, the, from the attack on the harbor. One of the big misconceptions is the Japanese destroyed everything, had anything to do with Pearl Harbor, which is pure bunk. Um, yeah. so that could be checked, but I have to look at the landing times for all the groups that landed back on board and check it against Fuchida, but it, it could be done. Another, another one from Christopher would like to know whether or not any Japanese mini subs actually penetrated the harbor and torpedoed any, any ships that day. Well, they tried to, uh, and this, this is a big controversy. It's big scandal, Bolshoi skandal, as the Russians would say. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, controversy about this. Uh, I remember at the 60th anniversary when, I think it was this country called a company called Autometrics came and gave a presentation on a very well-known picture that was taken early in the attack of the torpedo attacks against Battleship Row. And they were saying, well, this looks like a mini sub that's porpoising up or something like that in the harbor. But I don't think anything like that happened. There was one submarine that did get in. Uh, it was, it was a, one of the midgets that came around the north side of Fort Island and tried to um, to attack some of the utility uh, ships that were moored uh, near Pearl City. And uh, they also fired at the uh, submarine Monahan, which actually rammed the submarine. And uh, she was charging ahead at such speed that the, the shore actually impacted uh, the shore and she had to go back and forth with her engines to try to get free. And then she eventually went out of the harbor. But I don't think another submarine made it in. Um, 
the, the secret to that is count the torpedoes, not the submarines, count the torpedoes. There were the two torpedoes from the Monaghan midget sub. There were two uh, uh, torpedoes that were on Ensign Sakamaki's submarine that was uh, beached off Bellows. There was another two that were uh, in the submarine uh, that, uh, that was found in Cahai Lagoon. There were uh, uh, there were there was another submarine, uh, a, a fifth one, that launched two torpedoes against the St. Louis when she came out at about 0945. Well, that's ten torpedoes. So, how are you going to have another submarine come in, and for what reason? So, I, I think that one got in, attacked the, I think it was the Medusa and the Monahan, but I don't think any other submarines got in. Okay. Kimberly would like to know, was there any radar capability on the islands at the time? Actually, more than one would think. Uh, mm -hmm. We had, uh, the Army had six large, uh, um, I can't remember the Signal Corps designation for, for the radar, but they had these, these huge bed springs that uh, you know, would be about uh, half the size of a modest size ranch house. They're huge things. And they, put, they uh, erected these on all the the high points around Oahu to check various swaths of anywhere from 30 to 90 degrees around the island. The most famous of these, of course, was the one that was at Kahuku Point, which actually sighted uh, the incoming Japanese. But beyond that, there were radar sets on at least four of the ships. There was, let's see, boy, you caught me off guard. Here. I think it was the West Virginia, the Curtis, California, and there's one other one which doesn't come immediately to mind. I'd have to stutter too much. But there, there were at least four sets like that that had been erected on, on various ships. Well, um, I've got another question here from, from Woody. And uh, aside from the reconnaissance aircraft that were able to launch, well, what was the, uh, could you briefly speak about the other air response to the attack? Okay, well, those came from four different Army airfields. First of all, there were bombers that took off from, uh, from Hickam Field. Not very many because the Japanese had really done a number on the, uh, the, the bombardment force at, at Hickam. And they were just, the ones that were close to being airworthy, they were still patching up and everything. But uh, they, um, I think about three, about four A-20s, which are some light bombardment aircraft, took off. Uh, there were, uh, I think, three B-17s which tried to take off, although one uh, ground loop because they forgot to take the wind gust locks off the elevators. And of course, the, uh, the tail lifted up and the propellers hit the pavement and they, so they had to repair. But there were two of those that got off. Everybody going in the wrong direction. They, they, none of them went in the right direction to catch the Japanese. And uh, then there were also a couple of B-18s that actually went out to the north, but their range was insufficient to, to find the Japanese. And in addition to that, we had three fighter bases, uh, one at uh, Haleiwa, another one at Bellows, and one at Wheeler from which about, depending on how you count them, 12 to 14 American pursuit pilots got up during the attack and there were a great many more that got up that day. We had close to 75 fighter pilots, 75 now, got up during the attack, or 75 sorties, which is astonishing. I, until I started examining the, uh, the flight records that are in St. Louis at the National Archives there, I never dreamed that there were that many. But that, that's been one of the great revelations that, that really surprised me. Well, you know, Mike, you've clearly made a lengthy study of the Pearl Harbor, and I was, I was curious to know, um, what drew you to it initially? Well, uh, it, was a, it was a book, <laughs> I pulled this out the other day, I have to do this. It was a book called We Were There at Pearl Harbor by Felix Sutton. It's a little piece of historical fiction. I had a real good friend who unfortunately died about a week ago. He uh, uh, he was uh, a real good friend of mine. He came to me in the sixth grade in Ms. Davis's room there at Wells Elementary School. He said, Mike, there's this book that I need to show you. It's called We Were There at Pearl Harbor by Felix Sutton. And this, uh, I, when the first 
thing he uh, the first thing I asked him about, I said, well, what's Pearl Harbor? Which would seem kind of silly that I would say that now, but I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. And I guess my mom had not lectured me about it. But, uh, but in any case, I took that book and when I read it, it just bowled me over. I said, this is good stuff. And from there on, there, there out, I, I, from there on, I, I was, it would kind of go in a sine wave. I'd have these uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder bursts of interest. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd look for stuff and look for stuff. And then my interest would flag, particularly when I got in high school and started dating girls. But then when I got into college, it started ramping up again and went down. But then in the, uh, after the uh, publishing of At Dawn, we slept in about 1980. I really started to do some serious research up in Washington and, and, and elsewhere at the various archives. So. I think that's how a lot of us get started. I've got another question from Christopher and he wants to know, was there any Japanese aerial reconnaissance of Pearl Harbor prior to the attack? Yes. <clears throat> the uh, Japanese, and this was a big sticking point before the attack, when, they, when the Japanese uh, task force sortied from the home islands and anchored at, at, in Hitakapu Bay, which is actually owned by the Russians now, uh, they had all the, the uh, air crews gather on the Akagi, which is, one of, which is the flagship, and they started revealing that they were going to send out the whole big raft of planes out toward Oahu just to scout everything out, and the pilots blew up. He said, are you trying to get us to commit suicide by you know, having us follow this because you're going to give away the game? Why do that? And yet they had to know, the Japanese had to know whether the Americans were really in Pearl Harbor or had a sizable portion of the fleet gone out east to, uh, to the uh, Lahaina anchorage off the island of Maui. And so they said in order to be able to decide this and tell Commander Fuchida, who is going to be in the air at that point, We've got to get two planes, one to scout out the Lahaina Anchorage and one to scout out uh, uh, Oahu and find out what the heck is there. And so they did that and they, want, they uh, sent the telegrams uh, by, in Morse code back to uh, Fuchida at about, they, about 7.30. But it was just, they, Fuchida just had barely enough time to absorb everything and realized, thank God, I don't have to go to Maui now. I can throw everything at Oahu because he had all these contingency plans that he was going to have to send to have his radium and send out in code. And it would have just, it, it would have been really, really complicated. But, uh, but yes, there was a, uh, a, a, an effort, but it was just prior to the attack. All right. Now, as we remember 80 years later, Mike, what do you think is one of the most important things to remember about Pearl Harbor? today um well first of all i i think it's it's really critical for us to remain prepared and remain vigilant uh, 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 and have our eyes open to the possibility of of potential foes and what they might do to us we've, we've got to, we've got to maintain that visibility and uh, uh, clearly there are some epic failures on December 7th and, and the weeks before, where the military, although they'd done everything they could to train and prepare, and they, they, there were just some, uh, some, some items that they failed to take advantage of that might have saved us from, uh, from having a disaster there. The other is that you know, as I go further into life and I see my friends from high school to die. I mean, we've had a tremendous number of people in the class of 68 at Fike High School that have, uh, they're no longer with us. And particularly with um, these World War II veterans. I mean, ev almost every single person I've interviewed regarding Pearl Harbor is gone. The only exception is uh, one of the torpedo pilots from uh, the Soryu that's in Japan. All the other guys with whom I corresponded with are, are are gone, and that's really unsettling. And so the the only vehicle we have now is a printed word, or when when somebody like 
me gets off and runs off at the mouth about all this and, and goes and speaks somewhere. That's the only way to keep all this alive and to keep the memory of these men alive. I mean, we really do owe a debt of gratitude to these vets, um, particularly the larger World War II generations. We can never repay. There's nothing we could ever do to pay off that debt. It's, it's unpayable. I, I agree with that's, you. That's, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that motivates me to keep me going. And that's one of the thoughts that it's the, the forefront of my mind whenever I'm writing and I, uh, I'm getting tired of it. And of course, my wife is tired of this. You know, she asks me frequently, why in the world do you keep going? But that's one of the things that does keep me going. All right. Well, Mike, we thank you so very much for presenting your webinar with us today. We do appreciate that. We thank the audience as well for joining and participating in what's gonna be our last webinar of 2021. We, we hope to see you in the new year and uh, stay tuned, check our website for upcoming webinars and events. We appreciate the ongoing support of the, mu of the museum and our programs. Y'all have well, a great day. Well, I tell you, I appreciate this so much. I really wanted to thank the, uh, the people who have signed on uh, to, to watch this and take part in this webinar. I appreciate the, uh, the questions there. There's an excellent, excellent question. We didn't have to do one that we put into your grab bag. So that was good. During a, you, have an, you had an engaged group, which was excellent. Thanks a lot, Mike. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you.